Hey, what's up? Welcome to x86 in a nutshell. I bet you didn't know that you can learn x86 in 10 minutes. Yeah, sure you can. Uh, there are eight general purpose registers that we really care about. These registers are 32 bits long, hence the 32 bit architecture. 32 bits is four bytes. These registers are extremely important because you'll see them all over the place used for everything. Turns out that there's a ton of special purpose registers, but we don't have time to talk about those. And they're not very important for most of the things that you're gonna end up doing, especially when just starting out. So we have the EAX register, the EBX register, the ECX register, and the EDX registers. They are extended versions of their former counterparts in 16-bit, meaning that they're 32 bits wide instead of just 16, hence the E for the extended. A little bit of trivia knowledge for you there in case you're at a bar. These registers are interesting because they can be referenced on the lower order bits. So if you want the lowest order one byte, you can ask for AL, or if you want one byte up from that, you can ask for AH, or if you want the lowest 16 bits, you can ask for AX. If you wanted to do the same type of thing for ESI or EDI, you have to take the full 32 bits and mask off the top. And if you're thinking, no, you can't ask for the top or higher order, there's no like, a, H, H, higher, higher, or something. It's just the lower part of that, what's referenced here. The stack pointer and the base pointer are interesting because they define the stack frame, which we'll talk about in a second. These are the eight registers that you need to know. There's another one called EIP, or the instruction pointer, which is where we're actually executing. It points to the next instruction to be executed, but we don't actually put things there ourselves, even though that's what we aim to do in certain situations. The Intel syntax is one of the syntaxes that you can actually encounter when dealing with x86. So x86 compiles down into machine code or these op codes, they're bytes that the processor understands. And when we lift that up one layer, we're lifting it up into uh, mnemonics and operands. These mnemonics and operands define what things look like. For example, this move EAX zero, uh, this move EAX one hex. That operation is defined as destination first, source second. And basically that means Intel syntax. There's AT&T syntax, which is for most people considered legacy. Um, it has percent signs, it's destination second. It's kind of gross and ugly for me at least because every modern tool that I've used since starting to learn and work with x86 has used Intel syntax. And I believe that's gonna be the case for you too. Basically, everything is gonna use Intel syntax. If you hop into GDB and it shows you AT&T, you can actually set the disassembly flavor to Intel and not have to worry about it. So there's this concept of an instruction, which is your um, mnemonic, and then you have these uh, operands, the destination and source. When we talk about destination first, it means that the destination, the first operand is where things are gonna go. So this move one into EAX, we actually move from the source into the destination. This add EA, add EBX, ECX is gonna take EBX and ECX, add them together, and then take that result and store it into the destination, which is the EBX register. So EBX will be overwritten, ECX will continue to be whatever it was before this uh, operation was executed. The LEA is load effective address, so it gets the address of this location. Anytime you see those brackets, it means we're going to reference uh, location and memory. EBP is the base pointer. So we go at an offset of 68 hex from that and we get the, the address of that location and we store it into EAX. That's it. That's the concept of destination first and Intel syntax. The concept of the stack, uh, obviously we think of like two main memory regions in an application. One is the heap. That's when you have to actually ask uh, the kernel for uh, new memory, and the memory manager will dole the, that stuff out to you, um, and it will uh, request stuff as it needs it and manage all that memory for you. The stack is this contiguous section of memory that just sort of exists in your application. You don't really allocate more of it or ask for more of it. You basically just move these pointers around that end up sliding this, this window, if you will, around this stack. And when you move ESP, around that stack, it sort of floats up and down. If ESP and EBP are the same, it's considered a collapsed stack and there's no space on the stack. When we subtract from ESP, it ends up creating space on the stack, which is this mind blowing thing. It turns out that the stack grows towards lower addresses. 
So in order to quote unquote create space on the stack, you need to subtract from ESP, right? So what you'll see in certain operations is we'll take the base pointer EBP and subtract some value in it to reference the location on the stack. When it's doing that, it's going into the stack frame. If it added to EBP, it would be going into a previous stack frame and that's outside of the region of where we wanna be under normal conditions and that would be bad. There's this concept of a flags register. So I did say that there were some special purpose registers, right, that we were gonna ignore. This is one that we're gonna talk about. The E flags register is gonna have certain bits that respond or correspond to certain flags that are interesting for us. Zero through 31 or 32 bits. Each one of these bits has a special purpose. Some of them are reserved and not used. They're either zero or set and they have to sort of be that way. But the arithmetic flag, specifically the carry flag, the overflow flag, and the sign flag, and the zero flag are really important. The trap flag is gonna be set in the debugger when you're single stepping. The picture on the top right is uh, a picture from x86 debug, and it shows these important registers. And if you notice, TF is actually set. That's because when I took the snapshot, I was single stepping through the application. The trap flag is set when you do that. Um, so that's kind of it. These flags are really important. So it turns out these flags are really important because there are comparison operations that are gonna set them. And then there are other operations in turn that are gonna use the value that's in those flags registers. There's two primary operations that we're concerned about in terms of comparisons or setting those, those flags. One of them is a test and a test performs a bitwise and between two operands and then ends up setting the zero and sign flags accordingly. The comparison uh, or CMP operator essentially performs a subtraction without modifying registers. So if you do a subtraction, not only will it set the flags register or those bits in there, it's going to also modify um, the destination register. When you do a comparison, it does this pseudo subtraction, but does not modify the destination register. Now that's really important to us because usually a couple of instructions after a comparison or a test is gonna be some conditional operation that is gonna cause control flow to branch to the left or to the right or to do something very special. In those cases, jumps are a really good way to sort of illustrate what actually happens. And there are a ton of them. Some of them I think are actually missing from this list. Whether or not we use jump of equal or jump of not equal or jump of greater or jump of greater than equal is really a compiler sort of design optimization decision. So just as an example to illustrate the jump of equal or jump of not equal, we have two pictures here from Binary Ninja with a random thing thrown in here. So the middle picture that we have, we have a move which is destination first. Remember, this is Intel syntax. We have EAX that goes into EBP at a 14 hex offset. And it's a subtraction, which means it's growing towards those lower addresses and it's referencing into the frame, not outside the frame. So this is perfect, this is great. It's actually taking EAX and putting it on the stack. Then what happens is it goes and compares that same location to zero. And then it turns out if that EAX is not zero, or not equal to zero, it's going to branch to the left, to the green path, and uh, take that route. If it turns out that EAX is zero, it's gonna go to the right or take this red branch. The test instruction on the bottom just goes to this location and gets one byte from that memory address. And if that one byte is equal to two, it's going to branch to the left, to the green path. If it's not to anything else at all, it's going to go to the right or this red path. Four bits is half a byte. Some people call it a nibble. You can think AX, BX, CX. That's the half of the EAX register that we're referencing gives you that one nibble. Whoa, 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 whoa. Future John here. No, that's not right at all. As a matter of fact, one nibble is something that has given me such horrible problems in all of this. I made lots of typos as to what a nibble was and the representation of it. Uh, Bottom line is you, we're not gonna use it. Um, it turns out when I said think AX, BX, CX, that is so wrong. AX is two bytes. Um, a, you know, EAX is four bytes, AX would be two bytes, and AL or AH would be one byte, not half a byte or a nibble. Um, this whole representation here of the, the eight zeros represents bits 
And in my head, when I look at this, I think uh, bytes. This would be four bytes. So anyway, uh, what I just said was completely wrong. So completely disregard that. Moving on from eight bits and one byte onwards, um, I think is pretty accurate. So um, forget what I just said. Thanks. A byte is eight bits. 16 bits is two bytes or one word. Here's where things get confusing. It turns out that the word length can be different for different architectures. So you might say, ah, two bytes, that's one word in this obscure microcontroller architecture. Wrong. They might actually consider the word length to be different. Um, it turns out that in x86, one word is two bytes. So when you talk about somebody saying a word, they're talking about two bytes. But know that in an other architecture, when they say a word, it may not necessarily mean two bytes. Just some food for thought. 32 bytes or 32 bits is four bytes or two words, which equals one D word or double word. You're gonna see D word a lot because it's the width of one register. It's an extremely important value. 64 bits, it turns out that even though this is a 32 bit architecture that we're gonna be talking about, there are certain instructions or certain ways to actually combine registers and actually can, can like make the pseudo 64 bit register. So it is possible to actually get 64-bit values on a 32-bit architecture, uh, but they're for special instructions in special ways that you reference them. So uh, it turns out this concept of eight bytes or four words, two D words, and one or one quad word is important, even though we're dealing with a 32-bit architecture. So these are the basic concepts for x86. I'll see you in the next video where we actually jump into the Hack the Holidays content. See you then.